Now, we're going to take more uh, analysis on this with Tyson Slocum, Energy Program Director at a Consumer Rights Group, Public Citizen. Welcome to uh, Biz Asia America. Let me ask you the same question I, I asked Dan. If a deal doesn't get done in the next few hours, how does that change the mood heading into Paris? I don't think it's going to really change anything uh, that dramatically because you're already seeing a number of unilateral agreements like the one reached between China and the United States. And that's really going to be the driver. You know, at a convention like the one in Lima where you've got every country represented and they all have equal uh, shares and equal say, it's going to be very difficult to move progress. The fact of the matter is, is that a deal is going to be brokered over the next year between the largest emitters to not only come to some sort of agreement on reducing emissions, but on coming up with some sort of financing for but, poor but, countries. But look, we knew this going into this meeting. Mm -hmm. We knew all the complaints from the big countries, the old countries, from the new countries, right. to developing countries. We knew all the disagreements. They had plenty of time to argue about this on the sidelines. When you get to the conference, you're supposed to have your talking points. You're supposed to have the things that you do agree on. How come we haven't seen the stuff they actually agree on? I mean, I'm fine to ignore the stuff they don't agree on. Right. Well, I, I think that they're, they're still trying to negotiate, but the big difference here is that uh, Europe and some of the poor countries want legally binding emission uh, targets for everybody. And the United States and China are more saying it's okay to have some voluntary uh, and not very detailed commitments. And, and I think when it comes down to it, the, the Chinese and the U.S. proposal is what's going to win out. And the U.S., along with other countries, have already come up with some cash. Now, I know that the Republicans in Congress in the most recent spending bill uh, negated that money, but that's okay because it would have been two years before it's appropriated. So even though there's some domestic disagreement within the United States on but, to address climate but change. I, mean, I, I know you're trying to put, be optimistic on right. this. I understand that. But if this thing fails in Lima, we don't get an agreement. Mm -hmm. Isn't it the same thing as the UN essentially failing? I mean, they're leading a lot of this discussion. Um, the, the process of, of having these talks go through the United Nations is very difficult and problematic. And like I said, I think that the real engine of negotiations is going to be in something like uh, the G7, where you've got the largest economies that have the financial wherewithal and also have the footprint on, on emissions. They have to come to an agreement. And that's why you see these bilateral uh, yeah. uh, talks like you have between China and the United States. Speaking of which, you have 195 countries. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the big ones just spin off and just do their own thing. And the, the other ones, if they want to follow on, great. If they don't want to follow on, follow on the world can't wait for everyone to agree on reducing you know, gas emissions and, and, and focusing on climate change. I mean, ultimately, might that be what comes out of Paris? Absolutely. And, and I think we're, what you're also seeing here are some of the market dynamics are driving us towards a, a, a more cleaner energy future. You're seeing coal consumption flatline and projected to go down. And the more important thing here, and, and for any deal to work, you have to have cheaper economics for cleaner energy. And that's what we're seeing, particularly in the electricity sector, where renewables in, in the United States, for example, in many parts of the country are coming in yeah. at the same Despite, price by the way, or since, cheaper. Since you mentioned that, we're watching oil very closely. It's right. been a disaster. If you're an oil investor, it's great if you're a consumer. But for the climate, I don't think it's that great because then people view oil as sort of abundant and cheap. Um, how does that impact this, these discussions, or at least the psychology of climate change? There's no question that this, this sudden drop in crude oil prices, right, it's down over 40% since June, was kind of unexpected. I don't see it as being a long-term trend. I think that most analysts are going to see an, an upturn in oil prices middle to, to late next year. So I don't see big parts of the economy in the United States and elsewhere kind of readjusting to the trend that they've gotten used to over the last couple of years, which is we need to downsize automobiles, we need to invest in more uh, fuel efficient vehicles. So I think those trends of flatlining oil consumption in the United States aren't going to be reversed by what is probably going to be a temporary dip in oil prices. Very quickly, where is the leadership on this? You mentioned China, you mentioned the United States. There's some other big countries around the world that we haven't heard from. I'm not going to name names, but why are they not saying more when it comes to the negotiations of getting a deal done? Well, I think the EU has been very vocal. I think that India has 
has been vocal, and they've been at, at, at loggerheads with the United States and elements of the, of the EU as well. But I, I think it's, it's all these different countries trying to put together a collective deal while still furthering their own national interests. And that's where well, uh, the, the problems at a UN discussion uh, come up. I think you'll agree, but for the sake of, uh, I guess, climate change and the world, I hope they can set politics aside, at least for a short time. We can hope. Tyson Slocum, good to see you. Thank you very much uh, for your analysis 